everyone to Tech Talk Tuesdays. I am your host this evening. My name is Alexia Beckford and I'm the program manager at the Jamaica Technology and Digital Alliance. I know many of you were expecting the VP of Marketing and CEO of Salus Technologies, Pretty and Thomas to be here. Unfortunately, she's unable to make it. However, I know that we'll have an exciting and educational show this evening. So I'm excited to announce our topic which is tech talent in the region i know many persons here dr man singh michael gordon jeff Huntington, are excited to talk about this and i'm just so excited to hear what is going to happen you know what are the expectations for the gen z's out there and even millennials like myself so i'm so proud to introduce Dr. Gunjan Mansing. She is the VP of Innovation and Education at Jamaica Technology and Digital Alliance. She's also the head of computing and senior lecturer at University of the West Indies. And if you're a ComSci student, you know Dr. Mansing. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Jeff Waddington, CEO of Real Acquired Global Services and also Deputy President of the Jamaica Technology and Digital Alliance. Jeff is an IT entrepreneur. His company is developed into a leader for multi channel e commerce and application development space, extending from its community into the US and the Caribbean. Welcome, Jeff. Michael Gordon is the Director of Innovation at the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. He stewards various innovation activities, ensuring that the customer is at the center of product development and service delivery. Welcome, everyone. Glad now, to, be here. Right, to get things going, really want to ask what you believe are some of the key career drivers you've leveraged in your early career. Dr. Mansing? Well, I was a software developer before I went into teaching, Alexia. I was, um, but I did do a little teaching when I finished my undergraduate degree, which was in physics and computer science. My major was physics and my minor was computer science. Computer science was not that common at that time. I don't know which era I belonged to. <laughs> and not, not the Gen Z era for sure, which is so digitally, um, you know, in, in their, everything they do, they're, uh, they're digital beings, they're digital yeah. uh, natives, absolutely. So I, I was a software developer and I was doing teaching when I just started. Uh, I was just killing some time and I started teaching programming in an institute. And um, I came into academia because I came in as a research student to do my MPhil, to do my PhD. And it seemed, teaching then seemed to be the natural progression for me to get into because um, Teach, meaning academic job is just not just about teaching. There is a teaching component and there's also a research component. So I think both of those areas excite me. Uh, just learning new things, you know, working with students, uh, be it undergraduate students or be it research students. And hence, the and as a programmer, as a software developer, I don't know anyone who's, you know, this eureka moment that you get when something works. And, uh, and hence... I, I, you know, I want everyone around me to experience that Eureka moment because it is a concept of creativity which you can get as a software developer, which is not, and if you're not a very artistic person, like who's doing art, then it's always harder to get that. So I think software development is one way of actually getting creativity going. Okay, great. Jeff, want to hear from you because you have a different perspective based on your upbringing in Canada. So I want to hear what were some of your key career drivers? Yeah, well, I, I grew up around technology. So every when, when I grew up, all, all the people around me worked in tech, nuclear engineers and systems engineers and software engineers. So it's kind of a, a natural thing when you see everyone around you doing it that you kind of naturally fall into it as well. So that was one of the influences there. But I think one of the things that really shaped my view of it is we talk about tech talent and oftentimes people think programmer, right? But really the aha moment for me was realizing that technology is change. It involves change around people. It involves change around how people interact with each other, how they interact with technology. And so my interest was really spurred around uh, the people and the technology coming together. And so my passion was ignited around that. And so I think one of the things we should talk about a little bit is tech talent is typically just talked about programmers or, you know, the highly, highly technical implementation part, but it's actually a much broader set of skills. And it's actually, you know, if you're someone who's maybe not the 
really into the programming aspect, but really likes to, like I do, inspire people who are really good at it programming, then there's a lot of careers available to people. Okay, great. Just want to mention for myself, when I came in the IT space, I was not a coder, I was not a programmer. I remember telling somebody mm. years ago that, listen, I, I, I am not a traditional techie, you know, you know, tell me codes and programming, I'm like IT projects, I'm bringing stuff to life, that is my area of expertise. So you are right. Sometimes when you hear tech talent, it's like, where do I fit in if I'm not coding, if I'm, I'm okay at math, but I'm not the best. So I love that you highlighted that. And just the fact that Gunjan said, listen, I was a software developer. Because many persons think that when you get the degree or the certification, you're just going to stay in that lane. And I believe ICT is such a wide spectrum and you're going to evolve throughout the years. Michael, you know, you're from University of Commonwealth Caribbean. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in? How do you nurture the students who come in with an interest in technology, but you know may not know where they where they fit? Well, I mean, UCC is a business school. Our prime, all our courses are geared towards business activities, right? So a lot of our technology is focused on solving IT and IS problems. You know, getting a company up and running, business solutions. So we focus. We, we, we tend to focus our students on solving a business need. So you find an IT project might surround something like mental health and they go around and they interview the various stakeholders and the issues and problems. And then they lend or they arrange assets available, the computer, the network, the mobile app, process, business process, workflow engine, stuff like that, you know, authentication. And then the different stakeholders, whether it be the, the people licensing the, the, the practitioners, the people keeping track of the, the security of health records, of course, the patients themselves and the, the healthcare professionals. So we, we try to focus our kids on solving a problem, solving a business problem. As well, of course, as Jeff has said, collecting the cash as well. Where is the payment component and, and how the business going to sustain itself? Find a problem, solve it, monetize it and keep it sustainable, keep it running. So yeah, as a business school, we, we focus on entrepreneurship and the, the process is on entrepreneurship and resources necessary. I saw uh, the, the LinkedIn user said uh, there are only two girls in the class. It's kind of fit now where I think there may be like five guys to maybe 70% women. It's completely rotated since, since, since then, uh, especially IT. So yeah, this is a different world altogether. Yes, I, I mean, I found that because I've encouraged many young ladies like myself. I'm like, listen, don't limit yourselves. I mean, yes, you may not have your degree in IT, but there are certifications out there. There are things you can do. And if you have an interest in IT, you can go back and get that degree. So I'm really encouraging persons on this call to just follow your passions, your talents. A lot of persons are multi-potentialites. So don't just limit yourself to one thing. I mean, we're going to go a bit deeper on the back end. We were speaking to Jeff and Michael a bit. So they're going to tell you their stories of evolution within the tech talent space and probably that can provide everyone on this call with some tidbits so as we jump right in what does the future of work look like for gen z's dr mansin spoke on them you know they're very digital what do you think the future of work looks like for gen z's you know one thing about gen z's are that they they're going to take over the workforce i think quarter of the workforce will be these gen z's and while they are motivated by pay they're also motivated by a work-life balance and they want things in place. And I'm, and this, I'm not looking at the young people I interacted with, but the young graduates that I'm sending out in the market, in the industry, I find that if they get to work in a, in a big tech company and they're living in America or Canada, that makes them happy. It doesn't. Uh, I think they're, they're happier if they are actually working in Jamaica and wherever the tech company may be. So I'm finding that it's not just all about the career, the career pathways. It's also about a work-life balance. And uh, and hence the whole nature, you know, the, the whole ecosystem of how this work is evolving is changing. And that's something that gives them greater agility to work anywhere in the world. And that's as a software ecosystem, as you know, Jamaica, we need to think about how do we maximize on that. And the young people, Alexia, that you spoke about, the Jam Coders camp that we had, it was 50 high school students from third form to fifth form. Um, they were 20 boys and 30 girls, and they were across, you know, all the parishes. We had actually representation of 12 parishes from the of the 14 uh, these students were from. 
36 of them were residential and 14 were commuting students. And it was a month long camp where they were taught um, concepts that are very typically taught at university level, maybe first year, second year, sometimes even third year. And what I enjoyed in seeing that they were sometimes thrown in the deep end. They were given all the help, but they were willing to expand their minds. And as one of these students said to me, and he said it in his testimonials, that there were three groups of students. There was there were one group which had great understanding. There was one group which had great confusion. And there was one group that had a great capacity to power nap. But I think in the end, even those ones with the great capacity to power nap after they were arrested and were thrown in the labs with these exercises and the teaching assistants that we had, they were learning something. And we had we had a lot of support for them in the labs. These teaching assistants were from institutions like UV, Harvard, Berkeley, Columbia and Stanford. And we had like, you know, these highly motivated young computing, computer science undergraduate and graduate students who were helping these high schoolers. And they had created by themselves these own big sibling, little sibling uh, relationships, and they're still helping them for problem solving. And I think for these young students to learn the capacity of what computer science is about, to me was amazing because their minds are very flexible and technology is, as you said, constantly evolving. So we need to make sure that they're not static in their learning. Most definitely. I have to agree with that. Jeff, what are your thoughts? What well, does the future of work look yeah. like for them? Well, it's interesting because we, we, in business here in Jamaica and overseas, we, we hear this conversation around it's a business problem or it's a technical problem, right? And and that differentiation between the two still seems to exist for those who are a little bit older. For those who are, you know, coming up and grew up digitally native, there is no difference, right? Business problems are technical problems and technology is, is intertwined into everything they do. And so growing up that way, their view comes into stark contrast sometimes with trying to deal with people who are saying, well, who's the business owner of this problem? Well, in reality, the same people need to own both the technology and the solution business side. So I think we, you know, who grew up maybe when those two things were a little bit more separate are still coming to terms with it, whereas Gen Z is going to have a lot more of that natively, right? But one, one of the questions I was going to ask uh, Dr. Mansing there, you know, is the, students are coming out, right? Younger people are coming out wanting this this balance. And I know that when I entered the industry, which again, was, was a while ago, there was sort of this intense period when you first start out where you sort of, you don't know as much and you spend a lot of time, you put, you actually put way more hours in, right? And this is not uncommon in accounting or in medicine or anywhere else where people just coming out of school have to put in a huge amount of effort. And, and that flexibility comes as a product of having to put in that effort. But if the expectation is now that sort of, you know, you come out and you're able to do work three days a week on a beach, is there a problem brewing in the sense that the industry, as far as I know, still has this early stage, much like any other profession, where you have to sort of prove yourself, where you have to learn very aggressively and put in the effort early in your career? I mean, I agree with you, Jeff. And I think this, uh, though, you know, the group that wants the work-life balance is the is other graduates who have already been in the industry and have been there for a bit, a little mature Gen Z's versus the young ones who are still in schools because the school people don't know what the work environment is about. But what I've seen is that uh, some of my students um, have chosen, especially during the pandemic, to come home and work versus be in isolation in another city. And that was quite surprising for me um, that, you know, that was their choice. It was sometimes even giving up. I think one of them even gave up an Apple job to say that I'll come back after the pandemic is over because he was feeling, let's say, a homesick kind of an environment. He had just gone to the new city and um, it was, it was, I guess, difficult during the pandemic to, to live in that isolated environment because he still hadn't made friends. So that concept, like versus someone a millennial or you know the even the generation above that would have pursued would have continued in that job and in that environment whereas this person took the step back and said hey i was working with this company i was making a little less but i can still come back work with them for a year and go again so that agility that they have um, and you're right they have to be very smart in in their learning process because if they're not that smart that they they are they cannot be that agile the, so the smartness is what is making them agile in this tech industry. And they know that. They know that they can, you know, in any tech interview they go, they can pass those tech interviews. And that gives them the confidence to take on anything. 
which is which is different than I think maybe 10 years before, where people would just go down that straight path and continue because they want to make that good career choices. Just to add to that, Dr. Mansing, what are your thoughts? Because I believe, you know, there are some persons within the tech industry when they're dealing with Gen Zs, they're like, some of them will say the stick to or the persistence to know that, listen, oh. I have to do two, three years, I have to do these hours, but at the end of this, this is the experience and these are the benefits. What are your views on that? I know quite a lot of persons are saying, okay, they want to come, they want to make the money. What about the hours? I mean, yourself jeff michael and even myself i believe that we you had to put in the work the the, the experience came with putting in the work and the hours not to say we weren't concerned about our mental health or work life balance but we had to put in the work whether it was a year two years of just honing those skills so that then when we are renegotiating options that person saw the work so what do you feel when employees are really trying to understand this friend generation because they're very different in how you interact with them and how they deal with team building skills. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, they're bright and they're agile, but I mean, remember they're coming in environments where it's spanning three groups. You're dealing with Gen Z's, you're dealing with millennials. Some persons are dealing with baby boomers and how we view technology and how we even view work-life balance and work is wholly different. So just what your thoughts, Michael, I'm going to tune in with you. What are your thoughts on that? And Jeff, as an IT entrepreneur, what are your thoughts? Okay, I, I think Jeff is probably the best one to answer that because he's really hiring them. So I can just give an academic answer that there is a new group of for people who you have to hire. What do you do to make it easier for them so you even retain the talent? I think that would be a challenge for an organization. Now, you know that they behave differently than others. Meaning just today, I was looking at a LinkedIn post of one of my students. Uh, she's about to graduate and she's working in Guatemala just for the sake of, you know, work, um, traveling and having an experience of working somewhere. And I know she was hosting a show called Gen Z's on RJR's uh, TV the other day. So very much a Gen Z and, uh, and is now living in Guatemala. And I saw from her LinkedIn that she's just doing it for, you know, the sake of learning and traveling. Recently, any of these new young, you know, Gen Z's that I've interacted with who do have jobs, the travel seems to come up often in that they wanted to travel, they wanted to travel. I think in the last few years, the travel has been so restricted that it's something that is really emerging. So people like Jeff now have to figure out how do you create that right environment for people who have these latest career paths? You know, it's all connected and they now we have explored the multiple work formats. So how do we make each one, you know, how do we use each of those work formats to get the best from all our employees and uh, i think that's that's a completely i think a work question which i think jeff amongst us is the most <laughs> qualified to answer <laughs> yes jeff i want to hear from you where you know that is concerned what are your views how can you help influence the talent that you are hiring right because a lot of them are coming in probably big eyed bushy tailed and be like yes I'm going to work here and then I'm going to be on the beach and I'm going to do the Zoom meeting from the beach in my first two months. Like, It's, it's tough, right? Because social media paints a picture of perfection, right? So so growing up around social media in the way that, that you know, Gen Z and, and people who have grown up immersed in it see this picture of perfection, see, see it as normal, right? That everything seems effortless or that, that to get to achieve certain things is, is easier perhaps than it is, right? It doesn't mean it's not a goal we should work towards, but I think sometimes the effort that it takes to be an overnight success, for example, is actually really quite substantial, right? And so you have to help people to come to grips with that, to say, you can do these things, right? And you have to paint them a path to get there, but also to say, you know, nothing nothing is easy, right? It, it does take effort. It is difficult to get there. It doesn't mean that you can't, but especially some of the, the, the sort of the personas that are out there that show that you can, you know, just walk, walk out of school and, and jump into a, a really well-paying career and work remotely on a beach is, is probably not the norm, right? And, and so how do we help people to sort of build a path that will get them there eventually, right? So the reality of, of the work that you have to get there, but also just to acknowledge that, you know, you know, the, the, the days that, you know, the employer and the employee, you know, had a certain relationship may be over, right? So you do need to paint a path for the individual, right? It's not just, hey, I, I want to get a job. It's a, hey, I want to get a job that reflects me, reflects where I want to go. And so there's a lot more uh, 
career management required to keep people uh, where they are. So understanding the goals that they have, understanding that they do eventually want to be doing this, or they want to have the flexibility to have a family, or they want to be doing these things. You know, it's a much more personal, crafted sort of career path than probably most people prior to this were, were used to having, right? Where you sort of, you have to be involved in those life goals and have to be painting a path for them. Um, but also keeping it realistic because, you know, some of the things that they may be hoping to do just won't happen, right? So that's the that's the balance we have, although the, the balance of power is largely in the hands of the tech talent these days, right? So the top tech talent can name their own price, they can do their own thing, and that does apply to those experienced, you know, top technical people. The problem that we run into is that's not everyone, and that's not necessarily the case. So if you want to have that, you need to be able to... to invest in certain things. And one of the big ones I think we miss out on is if you want to work remotely, you have to be really good at communication. And by and large, it's been underrepresented in the technical space, right? We don't talk as much about how to be an effective communicator, how to negotiate, how to persuade, how to how to get into the softer skills that are required. Because when you're in person, you can get away with a little bit more because people are able to read all the other cues that you're giving off and, and you can interact in different ways. But when you're remote, the need for skills around communication and all these other things and career management, right? That, that planning and the goal setting and everything else is much, much higher. And I, th and I think not everyone's aware of that coming out of you know what their expectations are. You sort of have to show them that there's a whole other layer on top of this that you need to get comfortable with if you want to have that remote lifestyle and work in technology. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the communication is a big thing. I don't think the hours goes away. I think what's different is there's no block of time. Work doesn't start at, at nine and finish at five. It probably starts at 12 and finishes at 10 p.m., you know, and there's there are several breaks in between, right? And you work towards a deadline. I think that's the difference with the Gen Zs and modern workforce, where you work toward a task, you submit a task, and it doesn't matter. It's the travel, the travel, the digital nomads, especially with the digital nomad visas, e-visas coming in. Our people are getting that work-life balance by just doing and living a life with a family and working wherever. Right, but like just the communication is critical because I had a similar experience about two weeks ago where one of the students that came in and got this job, so they're working remotely. But the tool set that the employer gave them um, was, was, let's call it now, was ineffective, was not good enough, right? But they're ready to leave rather than communicate and say, you know, there's a better way of doing this, you know, rather than me spending eight hours or 24 hours doing this, if you pay $10 more, $10 more, right? Oh, great. I could do this in 12 minutes. So I convinced them, that, you know, have them communicate, you know, have them craft a message. And they paid the tool, the employer was happy, everybody's happy, they're making money. So you're right. The ability that, that the, 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 the Gen Z these days, they want, they, they have an ability to demand price and demand the work environment. And they walk away very quickly, especially when just leaving school, they walk away very quickly because a lot of them, especially the bright ones, they have opportunities to move left and right. I think me and Jeff, we spoke about this before, or career management and prep, to, to get them work ready for tomorrow as soon as they leave college. You, you need the internship programs. You need all these little work up that they spoke about, like the boot camps. Yes. You need a lot of, that, a lot of those. You need a lot of case study based and project based learning where you build up and build these skills, you know, the technical skills and the social skills, the communication skills, and you know, all the conventions have to get ready. And yeah, you know, and you know, so that they can you know, they can make the environment what they need it to be, what they can work with. Yeah. Okay, great. I love that we touched on that and how they can adapt. You know, just spoke on soft skills. I think Doc spoke on that a bit about, you know, them being so technically savvy that they have all these options and some of it is not money's experiences of not wanting to be in one place and as we get to that what do you believe what are some of the current challenges we touched on it a bit but i just want to expound on it what are some of the current challenges that exist and how can it how can gen z's overcome the challenges to accelerate their career i know we touched on that a bit with communication but i just want to highlight and i want to talk with you dr manson what are some other challenges you believe that they need to overcome the challenges i think first of all this tech industry is evolving at a you know a very fast fast space pace and that is going to be if if you're this um, gen z individual is not a fast learner 
and is not someone who's always willing to learn, then that person in tech industry is in trouble. Because the moment you let go of the learning component, you become a dinosaur. Uh, because technology just evolves. And hence, your basic knowledge structure system needs to be very, very strong. And your training, I think, you know, your the knowledge skills levels that you have gotten in your training processes be become critical because they have laid a foundation. But the way the knowledge in this area evolves, it's, it's even hard for all of us to, I think, uh, keep up. And I think we'll all agree to that. Now, how do we ensure that our Gen Z is not only working well in the environment, but is continuously learning? Um, and the more and more digital and the technology skills are going to be needed in the organization. So they are not just, let's say, software skills that are needed. It's all different kinds of skills that are needed because technology is in everything that we do, how we live, we work, we interact with each other, we socialize. It's technology is in everything. It's even in creation. I think, Jeff, you had come to that uh, workshop we had had about AI and creativity, that how we are creating even art pieces, poetry, music, technology is very much uh, you know a big component of that so where technology is going how is our workforce going to be continually evolving is going to be a challenge as we move forward that's how i see it as a challenge okay great michael what are your thoughts i, I know you touched on communication you want to expound on that like what oh. other soft skills do you believe because from my experience, just being as an alliance and not-for-profit, interacting with these, you know, Gen Z graduates and even those in the midst of going mm -hmm. to university, some of the graduates, I believe they're very talented, but when it comes to, um, I love to say, showing up in a space and just saying, hi, I'm this and mm -hmm. hi, Dr. Martin, I'm this and I'm looking for a job or checked out my LinkedIn profile or my QR code. I actually had an experience, a conversation last week where we had a second year student from UE who volunteered for BizTech and she said, Alexa, I met all of these people. I wanted to intern there this year and I did a QR code business card. I showed no one the card. She didn't show anyone the card. So how can we, you know, empower them to really show up in the space and say, listen, go for that internship, go for that interview, even if you may not get it try how can we empower them because it's not like they're not talented uh, you know i don't know if it's shy or based on my experience many persons in tech like to do the work but they don't want like that spotlight on them how can we turn the light on them and say listen show up as your best self we need to see you we need to see your talents and your passions how how can we do that Michael, just your um, well, the, some of the stuff we've been doing that some success with is the hackathons and the business model competitions, where, where you get the teams together, you get them excited about the problem, you get them working, and you get them presenting. Uh, yeah, you have to coach them how to make a pitch properly, how to present the document, how to present themselves as a big thing. Um, you know, introduce themselves. And like I said, the confidence, that's just, especially when in a group and in person. You know, just going up to people, introducing yourself, exchanging a card, you know, showing a document and a gathering, you know, exchange information. So you have to, you have to coach them on all that stuff. You have to show them the, you know, the, the value in it. And you see the transformation. You might see some a young lady going in one night and she leaves. I mean, she's on air for the entire month. You see the status of the pictures from the events and everything, you know, is the greatest experience of their lives. So... Competitions, uh, group events. JF is very helpful. He's been into several events, talking and coaching with the kids. So that's very good. I mean, interacting with a big CEO, interacting with a large group of people. And I think another thing too is trust. Meaning if I do this and you promise that, that you will deliver on what it is that you promise. If I put myself out there, you know, I take the risk, I get out of my, my, my boundaries. You're gonna deliver on what it is you say. You're gonna get the promise. I think I think that is a trusting environment, and some kind of safety net for them to fall back on and, and get up back and just if you you know just to close off and get going again. I think that's that's you have to work on that. Yeah. Okay, great, Michael. Can I, I want to give a different perspective on that, and or maybe I should let Jeff speak first, and then I give my perspective. 
Well, I was going to just mention another big challenge that we're, we're facing in, in this regard. Um, so, and it might le lead back to it, but what one of the bigger challenges, and LinkedIn put out some research recently that entry level jobs now on average require two years of experience, which seems counterintuitive because entry level would imply it's the first job you get after you get your education, whether that's through yeah. these fine institutions or elsewhere. But if they now require minimum of two years experience in order to get your entry level job, there's a big gap. And it's particularly uh, uh, a problem here in, in Jamaica because we have a gap where you kind of you graduate but everyone just wants the, the people that have done it before and in fact when you go for interviews uh, with companies you go especially if you deal with companies overseas they're going to ask you first question I'm going to ask is what 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 was your last project what have you worked on what type of, of things you've done and it's very difficult if your only context is, is academic because they're looking for actual practical experience in the marketplace so so there's a gap right between graduation and actually getting that first job in fact the world is awash in people that have graduated but don't have the experience and when they talk about these fantastic salaries and all these things happening those are typically going to those who have experience in industry uh, especially high quality experience right so I can work in a job in tech, but if I work in the particularly challenging and interesting type of, of work, then I'm going to get more experience. And I'm going to get better sort of uh, value in the marketplace. And so we have a huge gap and it's a big problem. And Michael spoke a little bit to things like these uh, business plan competitions or getting involved, you know, getting your GitHub up, being part of Palisados or being part of different organizations and even volunteering time, doing an internship, getting your time in there. But there has to be that sort of initial stage where you get your experience because that's what the market values. That's what employers are looking for. And it kind of, for the first two years of your career, you're going to cost the organization more than you're going to be able to earn for them, the value you're going to create. And that's the reality for, it was the reality for me. It's the reality still today is for the first while, getting that experience costs money. Every mistake you make, someone else has to fix and that costs money. And so to get high quality experience is expensive and difficult, but it's what everyone looks for. And as soon as you get it, your career takes off very quickly. And so that's one of the bigger challenges I think we see for most people graduating is we have some great schools here. I mean, the, the graduates that are coming out of the institutions are are well equipped to meet the demands of the market, but their market's looking for people who have that plus the experience. <laughs> And that's where we come into a lot of gap. And especially when we have the people that do get the experience that are needed to mentor those who are coming up, get poached by organizations overseas, then we continue to have this brain drain where the people that will help people to gain experience faster are actually taken out of the market and not available to help grow the next generation. So we, we're facing that as a major challenge across all of technology, but it's particularly acute here in Jamaica. Um, to add to what Jeff said, you know, and he's right about having these experiences. And that's why I think in you know the internship that Michael spoke about and I think in Canada the whole co-op program kind of a concept that you're working in the environment before but what we try and do is uh, Jeff I've heard this from my students and the very student bodies is that they um, you know my students participate in open source projects they participate in uh, you know github kind of projects so that they can they're contributing to something and that that in a way it's building their portfolio so that they can showcase the projects they've worked on even without having actually maybe worked with an entity. So internships is critical. I think since 2009, we have had internship as courses built into our curriculum. That's critical and that's critical for all different skill sets that we spoke about earlier, you know, including communications, working in teams, um, being able to get your ideas across. So I think one way of uh, circumventing this two years experience is making your projects visible in a bigger space. And I think that will be, and it's not just, um, um, you know, open, uh, open source projects, but even sometimes students have a profile on various coding competitions, uh, right. online competitions. We yeah. tend to use Hacker Rank, and there are many other online challenges that they, uh, you know, they're on the leaderboard there and they have a ranking. So the world knows about them. And when the world knows about them, they autom automatically start getting job offers. Even one of my colleagues tells me that he keeps on getting a job offer every week because he's he's like you know participating in these uh, programming challenges so uh, so there are ways around it and i think we need to make sure in academia that we are telling that to our students all the time you know michael was talking about the hackathons and this about selling the project idea while 
it's important to have a good team and you have someone who is selling the project idea, you know, communicating. I, I find that sometimes my real technical people feel a little cheated in these hackathons. And I'll tell you why. Because they could have a better technical product, whereas uh, somebody is better at speaking about a product which may be hollow which may be nothing in the background and, you know, they don't end up really winning the competition. So I think we need to have a balance there that, uh, you know, we encourage that everyone can't have a technical person may not have the marketing skills. And hence we bring in people with different skills and ensure that they understand that every individual in that team is important and critical. But I, I don't know if trying to teach everything to one person would be useful or some aspects I think they need to learn. But uh, they can't be good at everything. So what is your take on that? I'm not sure as a workplace, how would you want your people to be? There, there's a need for, for specialization, um, mm -hmm. for sure. But, but for, for a lot of people who are earlier in their careers, I would, I would say, unless you're going into sort of a very specialized space, having a diversity of abilities. So, so understanding marketing to the point that at least you can appreciate someone who does a good marketing job or you understand some of the basic concepts is helpful, right? Because then you can have a better conversation with them without having to rely on the specialist to do it. So in general, we're looking for people earlier in their careers to have that diversity of experience uh, so that you can speak business, you can speak accounting, you can, you know, you can, you can fill all the hats if you need to, not as well, perhaps as the one that you want to do more, right, the technical side of things. But if you can't at least learn enough to appreciate what the other people are doing, you can end up, like you say, not shortchanged in some ways, because your, your message or what you're trying to communicate as a technical person is not being reflected by the specialist in that area right so if i can't put it together in a way that the marketing people can sell it well i'm in trouble right so that that diversity of skills is, is really important so i'd say early in your career try to learn as much you can about everything and, and demonstrating it through things like you know a github you know uh, account or other things where you can showcase that you have done this for real it's it's very helpful but and, we're looking for people that can do the diverse things because you can always specialize later. But if you try and specialize too early, you may miss out on something that you didn't even know existed, right? And so if you're if you're sitting there and it could be that you're a UX specialist, that you're actually really about how you know people interact with technology. But if you're sitting there focused on your coding and you don't build that diversity of skills, you may not be you may not expose yourself to things like technical project management or or any of these other pieces that actually is your true calling because you've decided to go narrow. So I'd say in the early stages of career, when you're out of school, get learn as much about every topic that surrounds the technology you're dealing with. Um, as much as you can. So that will give you that diversity. And then you'll find these little niches that, that someone I think in the comments uh, alluded to, which is where you can actually find something that you're really good at, that you're passionate about. But if you limit yourself too early and try and be a specialist too early, you're going to run into some challenges. So I say anyone in a technology field, please, please learn all these other skills as well. And I think that's where, you know, I think degree programs become useful versus certifications because certifications come as a, as a concept of specialization after you have identified the theme area you want to get into. But earlier on, when you're building your knowledge skills, uh, it's, you know, it's your so it's, you need to know the foundational concepts. And I think you touched on all the foundational concepts. You don't know what would excite you. And I think other disciplines do that, meaning when they are, I mean, I was to just compare it to, let's say, medicine. They do everything before, you know, they, they, they become a general practitioner before they become a specialist. And I think we in the industry are trying to shortchange that by saying certifications can be done in lieu of degrees. I think that's, there's a danger in that, which is exactly you highlighted too. Well, well the, the issue we, I think the issue we're trying to solve, you know, is 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 payment. The, I mean, tuitions are going up really high. So what we've been trying to encourage the students to do is to get the the, the core foundation, like the interest of programming, and then do a few certifications, then get a job, and then continue with the degree. Because you find the, the kids they can't afford it. The, the, the prices are I mean, are psychotic, you know. It's a ridiculous um, price and cost there, and people need jobs, and they can't get the jobs without the proper certs and training. So I think a blend, like a, um, this, this kind of get your foot through the door. Um, I, I mean, you, you see it's a bit different environment because most of our students are working adults, right? So a lot of them start off as bank tellers, and then they go into the passion, which is HR or something like that. So we continue a tradition where it's like, okay, you, you, you left high school, but you can't move on, you got accepted. You can't look, because even if you got a student loan, you can't leave. You have to take care of mom, you have to take care of child, or whatever. You know? 
So these short courses, the short courses help them along with the internships help them to kind of get into a financially more stable environment. So I think it's a trade-off. I mean, you do lose something, right? You do lose something, but I mean, the reality is that you have to get up and moving. Right? Yeah, but you're talking of the advanced student, you know, you're talking of a mature student versus a young person who's still building up their learning skills. I think what I said was not yes. for, you know, the students who are going to UCC, who are the mature students, who have done things in life, who have the maturity, who have the experience and now have decided what they want to do. So if they do a course here and go into certification, that's fine. I think that they have that maturity to know where in life they are going. But what uh, Jeff was saying earlier is that you, when you are in school, I think that's for, let's say, students who have finished their CSEC CAPE, coming into university, let them explore. Let them explore all the domains. Let them get a feel of everything and then go into specialization. That's how, you know, the the path of knowledge should be. That's how it should you, be. Yeah, it, yeah but, but, but. All in, and often what happens is that uh, people ha have been working for in a particular industry and, and know that mm. that's what they want. And mm. then they are as mature students coming back into studying. So you want you don't want to take them through the long path either. You want to mm. have a shorter path for them. So I, mm. I totally agree for them. We need to have different pathways uh, for you know, yeah, upskilling yeah, yeah. yourself in, in yeah. the environment. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. We're on that point, and I expounded on it a bit. My apologies to the audience for a bit of technical issues. Can you share some resources and tools to support the upskilling and reskilling? I know Michael was talking about certification. We were talking about, you know, not the mature students, but those who have left high school, exploring what it is they want to do. What are some resources that we can share today? Um, tools and resources for their upskilling and reskilling. They are always. Uh you know, university degrees and certifications that one can do, even organizations based on their own interests. Like, you know, for example, we have launched a master's in applied data science. Data science has become integral to everything nowadays. Uh, you know, that's something Gen Zs need to learn, breathe, eat. Everything is data related. And uh, so this data science program that we have conceived, Alexia, is uh, you don't necessarily need a first degree in technology. In By technology, I mean, you don't have to have a first degree in computer science, IT, or software engineering, You and you can still come and become a data scientist. We give you all the skills necessary to become a data scientist. So I find that doctors are becoming, you know, are doing this program, um, mathematicians, economists, uh, life science people. So many people from different backgrounds are coming and doing these programs. So that's... So the, and, and it's not just UE has a program. There are other programs around too. You can do these programs on Udemy. I think Edureka. All, all these, all these, uh, the MOOCs that we have. There are. There's a lot of content there. But you need to know what is it that you want to learn, and um, you search for it and you'll find it. But you have to like you know. Once you have gotten a taste of everything, you need to then figure out which is the environment I want to go into. Where do I want to? continue my specialization is it in networking is it in ui ux is it in software testing each one is a and or security let me not forget cyber you know security there are so many certifications in the security realm also which make you into a super specialist a uh, system administration or even programming or as a data scientist the list just continues and you can't become expert in everything so there is a point where you sit back and say which specializations am i going into and then you look for what is industry specific or in you know degrees in that area and take your knowledge forward. Great. And I just want to add for those of you, we have a partnership with the BCS, the Chartered Institute of IT. So when you do become a member of the JTD, you can upskill, you can upgrade your membership and learn more and learn more skills. And that is something that can definitely upskill you and help you. You know, Dr. Mansing mentioned you, Demi. I know that Google Digital Garage has some free courses. So that could be like a teaser for you to see if what you'd like or there are different things that are out there. But, you know, you have to follow what you're passionate about you cannot be an expert in everything so you have to just follow follow your passion follow what you're interested in jeff and michael your thoughts oh, other yeah. resources other yeah, resources I, I know michael you're going to say ucc because you know ucc has so many courses you know yeah, right? we have these courses we have yeah i mean the the boot camps like the boot camps that we're pushing we, um we encourage them for the for everybody to start out, you get you get you get access to various technology as well as you get an internship and uh, the practical experience, work experience. 
also have several short courses. Um, we have deals with uh, Coursera and others where you can get discounts on courses that they do, right? So yeah, you have as well as well as the other tools, the hacker rank. You know, where you get your access to those online online hackathons, where you get access to to to, to building on projects and build your resume, build a LinkedIn and and build a network, a global network, right? So. Um, yeah, I think as well, I think that's where you go. And it's going to Upwork, you know, go Upwork, find some simple jobs, you know, basic web development, and you keep upgrading until you, you know, you get some AI projects. I think, I think that's the way to start, you know, you, you price accordingly, right? So you, you know, you start at $5 until a few months down the road, you, you're up to $50, right? I think if you know how to market yourself as well in these global marketplaces. Depending on where you are, starting up from, right? So if you have kids, uh, if you've never seen Scratch by MIT, it's a free tool. It's really fun. If you just start now, you want to get people interested in it so early in their career to get this interest. So I'd say it's sort of an, a lifelong thing, right? If you get exposed to it early, it becomes normalized for you. So whether it's website builders or other tools, so you can just do things yourself. And one of the things to remember is, you know, a university or, or, or one of these you know, post, postgraduate certifications are, are very expensive, right? So the $5 for a Udemy course or, or whatever the case may be, in retrospect, is actually a very good investment, right? So dollar for dollar, if you want to get a quick, you know, intro sort of feel for something, you know, there's a lot of courses out there, a lot of one of the one of the benefits we have is we have a education allowance so people can go and take different courses and try these online learning things which is a great way to get a, a taste right like it, it, i don't want to i don't want to say that they are going to supplement completely they're not going to replace sort of the in-depth sort of learning because one of the things that a, a formal education will do is teach you how to learn right because it, it's something you have to do every day every single day i have to learn every single day i have to sound smarter than the day before otherwise I'm out of job, right? So it is a very competitive market in the sense that you always have to learn what you do pick up from going through the formal education programs are a way to learn as you go and continually assimilate new knowledge into what you're doing so that you can continue to be relevant in the market. So you can't discount the value of that in terms of where people are going. So the resources you get from being part of a post-secondary education program are, you know, one of the one of the things Carl, our, our 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 head of technology, says, I want problem solvers, right? Doesn't say I want Java developers. He says I want problem solvers, right? And at the end of the day, the technology will change because before it was Java, and now it's you know some some JavaScript framework. Tomorrow it'll be AI models. It's always about being able to learn quickly and 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 get those skills to solve problems. And so I think one of the things we need to, to differentiate is to get exposure to some of these technology things. There are free resources out there that you can do to sort of get that initial piece. They're very low cost um, compared to, say, you know, making a career move that you're going to go into this as a, as a post-secondary you know, education thing. Uh, I think that's it's relatively good for those things um, to get that that flavor of what you want to do. But I think a lot of the other challenges we have right now, and it's particularly here in Jamaica, if you're coming up in your career, you don't necessarily have as many role models to look up to, right? You're getting your, your opinions about what a career in technology is going to be like from uh, from television or from movies, which is very, very, not always the type of thing that makes sense, right? If you're, it's a very collaborative process, actually, to build anything of significance in technology, you need to collaborate with a team. You're not building anything that's going to launch a space shuttle on your own in your basement, right? But if you look at most movies, you know, the hacker sits alone in their basement and does this. And so it gets this reputation as, as an introverted, you know, antisocial thing. I mean, we're technical people, we're kind of geeky, we, we, we do, we're very social, we're just social differently, right? But that, that sort of concept that this is, you know, if you just go by what's on TV, you never really realize that actually there is a, a social component to this as well. And I think it's one of those things you mentioned earlier, um, that we have, you know, more women in technology education here in Jamaica, which is remarkable compared to the global uh, talent pool, which is very, very, very short on women developers, women in technology. And so I would say that we're actually producing uh, something that the world needs, which is that diversity, right? If we're building interfaces, if we're building technology that needs to be used by both genders, um, we need more women in technology. And if Jamaica's, you know, getting a leadership position, that let's push that further because it really is something that we need uh, to look at as well. So I, I I'm putting all this out there that there's free resources out there, there's all these things, but I think one of the things that we really need as a resource and the JTDA can help with that is a program like the one Dr. Mansing put forward, the Jamcoders one, how do we 
get more people in Jamaica to learn about these things. There are opportunities, right? We have all sorts of organizations that are putting on events, BCS thing that you mentioned there earlier. Like we have all these things out there, but there's not a good communication about what's available. So if you're a young professional and you want to know which meetup is happening tonight or which group I can join or what, you know, where I can send my kids for, for, for some of this education, uh, the clearinghouse that is the JTDA, really we can provide a lot more of that if we can get people both to join as members, but also to share these types of things that are going on so that we can make sure that everyone who is eligible or interested uh, can, can take advantage because they are out there, but we don't have in Jamaica a very good ecosystem of sharing this information. And I think, Alexia, that gives you a segue into the next question. About yes, I definitely want. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansi. You should have been my co-host. <laughs> you know, how can Gen Z monetize their new skills to create value for the economy through entrepreneurship? Um, Michael touched on it with Upwork. You have so many, you know, you have so many platforms right now. I think in this era, just to mention, there are different ways of making money. Persons are influencers, persons are content creators. There's no reason to monetize their talents, but Jeff just wants to speak on it quickly. How do I monetize my talents? Well, it, it depends on where you are, right? There, there are a lot of people in, in Jamaica right now that are trying to advance their business, digitize it, bring it online. And there's a mm -hmm. real lack of people who can help with that, right? So we, we do have a big, a big gap between sort of the high-end technical services that are, you know, supporting all the banking and everything else, and sort of the person who's looking to accept different types of payments or wants to have an e-commerce site that can that can work. So there's a lot of demand right now for people who aren't necessarily looking for, you know, the extreme of technology, but are actually looking for someone to help them deal with the challenges because there's so much uncertainty uh, in terms of adopting technology. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for people who are building up their skill sets or who, who are very comfortable working, for example, with uh, social media or social media marketing or these other things to help those people who are, who have the business or have the, the you know, have something where they have that business already in, in existence and they can help them to digitize and to get online right and we have tools and, and connections and marketplaces to link those people together but i think that's a real gap right now where there's lots of people who are looking for help to get online and to get digitized and to digitize processes move my accounting online you know get better all of these things they need help and there are people who can sort of as they get through their careers can help people at various levels on their journey right when you get to sort of our end of things you're you're dealing with you know big complex systems banks insurance uh, manufacturing but sort of as you move your way up right now one of the best ways to to get in there if you're not necessarily a professional is to, is to get you know those types of people and help them right because you're dealing with the business you're dealing with the person as well but there are, you know, there are marketplaces out there for for it, the Upworks and, and those other types of services. The challenge there, and the thing I would remind people of is, it's a global market. And so you're competing with people who live in places that are less expensive than here, right? Mm -hmm. The grocery, if anyone's been to the grocery store lately, it is very expensive to live in Jamaica. And mm -hmm. so if you're competing for work with people who are living in places where it's less expensive, you're not going to necessarily get the rates initially that you're looking for. And so I would just be mm -hmm. cautious about those types of platforms because you need a certain income to survive in Jamaica. And I would say those sometimes float a little bit low and they can also be uh, challenging to get paid uh, for some of them as well because the client has a lot of control over whether or not they accept the work. So just be a little bit cautious if you're going through those types of sites, but they can give you that vital experience and it can even if it's not instead of the most lucrative thing give you some referenceable work that you've done so that when you go to get a another contract or a different position you can use it so that's my only caveat there though is that the rates can sometimes be very low for what you get because you know it's not paid by the hour all the time sometimes you end up when you actually calculate how many hours you have to work for the amount of money you get it, it is quite low and it's and it's difficult to survive on that kind of money here in jamaica Okay. And I think what is important is, you know, in this last two years, uh, pandemic, everybody's become digitally transformed. Or it was it forced companies to become digitally transformed, even here in Jamaica. So as Jeff said, you know, the upper level of, you know, the, the business processes and the financial and all those are evolved. But it's the lower level, even our retail industry, our delivery service system, you know, food delivery, all that did evolve during the pandemic. And hence, there's a need for more digitalization. And, uh, and there, so there is a need. But then what happens is that we don't have 
we have individuals who are programmers and when you have a bid for something like that an individual can't do it they can't take on a project like that so we need to bring them together we need that mm -hmm. they can also create companies our, our software developers who are working independently you know the marketplace for them so that they come together pool in their services so they can even bid for projects like that i know some of the companies uh, you know that uh, that put out bids tell me that they don't get local persons bidding for certain projects and that's a that's an issue and when i ask these programmers why are they not bidding because when they look at the scope of work they feel that it's too big for them so it's a it's a mechanism that how do we then jtda bring them together mm -hmm. so that we can actually create that ecosystem of development out here going versus individual programmers who may be doing their little projects here and there and I just want to add for all the programmers, all the tech talent out there, you need to go on our website and sign up for our newsletter, www.jtda.org. We have our newsletter that comes out every Monday with all this information. We've had marketplace meetups where we put companies with the tech talent and we have a platform for that. So, you know, knowledge is power. We're putting out that knowledge every week. So sign up, sign up, sign up. Even if you decided not to become a member, but we want you to become a member, find out what is going on in the community, right? So but I know that we will put that link there. You can sign up for our newsletter so you can get that information going. I think this is so important for tech talent in the region. Just give us you know, your thought process that has guided your career success. My thought process is to, um, you know, help out others. And in, in helping others, it's uh, it's helping my research students, my undergraduate students. It makes me want to learn too and, and be creative. So it is the notion of service, which actually helps me to do what I'm doing. And that was what made this month-long residential free coding program, Jam Coders, so um fantastic for me as a as my summer which was very hard I, but i felt happy at the end of it so it is i think service which makes which is works for me okay great michael collaboration uh, building ecosystems uh, partnerships i think that's 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 the way forward in everything you do you can never actually do everything yourself you always have to need someone to, you know you know in everything that you do okay yeah. right, jeff those are perfect answers. I don't, I don't have anything else to add to that. The, the, the ultimately, one of the challenges we do have is there isn't necessarily the same level of collaboration or exchange and volunteering and, and coming together that, that exists in other places where there's a strong tech ecosystem, right? The, the ability to take someone under your wing, if a group wants to get together and bid on a contract or, or figure out how to do that, there's, there's, there's knowledge inherent in that, right? And there are people who do that all the time, like like our firm, who, who you know, if you want to learn it, maybe it's just a matter of asking, right? It's maybe it's, a, and, and that's the type of thing. And Michael sometimes calls up and says, hey, do you mind just talking to these entrepreneurs? Do you mind just having this conversation? That's sort of a culture where those who are, are experienced in the industry can just call each other up and, and, and do a few favors to really build the ecosystem, I think is what's made us successful, right? That, that, that the service and, but also what the JTDA stands for and what I think will continue to make us successful here in Jamaica is we really need to open up that concept of let's build a real ecosystem that will collaborate and give their time to create what we need to have. Okay. Wow. I think this has been such an interesting discussion and hearing the different perspectives from Dr. Mansing, Michael Gordon, Jeff Waddington, and in closing, any closing remarks as we wrap up this week's Tech Talk Tuesdays? Jeff, we'll start with you this time around. <laughs> Well, if anyone has any further questions, just, there's some great conversations going on in the chat there. And if there are further conversation, they want to get in touch. Is there a way to to sort of submit them to you, Alexia, or somehow? Get yes, them we can submit them. So I will put my email address. Raj will put my email address in the comments and I'll forward it. Let's not end this discussion. I know many of you, you know, you'll see Dr. Man saying, if you know, because we really want the cohort next year for Jam Coders to be larger than what it is, right? Really in support of that and nurturing that ecosystem from an early age so reach out to us at the jta they will forward the information to dr mansing if you're interested in sponsoring jam coders whatever you need to do any support mentorship um to help build these students who have learned this want to continue and accelerate that process definitely reach out you know this is a wonderful tech talk tuesdays we had the amazing dr mansing michael gordon jeff wallington and just finalizing everything we learned into some quick tidbits listen 
experience how are you going to get that experience as a gen z internships volunteers there are so many things happening you can reach out to jeff at real decor you can reach out to michael at ucc you can reach out to dr man saying at ua as well i mean real decor offers good internships there's a palace calico challenge offered by palisados foundation i mean you have linkedin there's so many resources there but you're going to need experience work on those soft skills communication is key show up Yes, if you cannot afford um, the degree at the moment, get those certifications. You can get them through Udemy. You can go to UCT. Dr. Mansing said, if you have a degree and you're interested, she's offering um, a master's in data science. Look into that. You know, education is key. Whether you're a millennial, whether you're Gen Z, you're baby boomers, many persons are multi-potentialites. So don't limit yourself help the jt they develop that ecosystem by becoming members join dr mansing's innovation and education committee we have some amazing things working out and contribute you may not be front facing and you may be introverted however as dr mansing said it she had a spirit of service and every person here has a spirit of service and wants to give back let us build out the ecosystem not only in jamaica but in the Caribbean, join us today as we provide access, influence, and empowerment through technology. It was my pleasure being here with you this evening. I look forward to seeing you at our upcoming memberships. Check out our social media pages. We have our conference coming up in November, Biz Tech. So look out for some amazing things. And any questions or concerns, you can reach out to us at www.jtda.org. Thank you to my wonderful guests. And I look forward to seeing you again next week for Tech Talk Tuesdays. Good evening. Have a great one.